because inventors really, I mean, I think they're the lifeblood of, of our economy. So the talk I want to give today is about what to do when somebody stole your idea. And I'll have some prepared remarks, and then, of course, I'll have time for questions if, if there are any. And in particular, I'm, I'm going to focus on the theft of patented ideas. So there are other areas of intellectual property that could be implicated when folks are, are you know, law of the jungle is, is prevailing and people are stealing ideas. But I'm going to focus on patents because that's where I've really devoted and concentrated my practice uh, for over the last 18 years. Um, so a little bit about me. I've, uh, I've been in this business for a, a little bit of time, uh, and I used to be a partner in a in a major litigation boutique firm, uh, and then after uh, after that, I co-founded a firm almost seven years ago, which is Fox Bart and Greenspoon, where uh, where five lawyers were microscopic in this world, but we seem we were very proud of ourselves, and knock on wood, we seem to have a pretty big impact in in this um, sub area of the law. So, I've been personally involved in all phases of. The inventor's journey. I've been involved in, in, in helping to draft and prosecute patent applications, and uh, all the way up through the United States Supreme Court, where I've I've defended patents and patentees. Uh, so the best context that I can give for someone who's first discovered infringement to teach them about what's what's about to happen is first to discuss what happens in court. And then sort of take a step back chronologically and then sort of explain what an inventor's options are in the shadow of what's possible in a court proceeding. So nothing else will make sense, I think, unless, unless first we all appreciate the anatomy of a court case. And I'll briefly go into that. That's really the focus of my slide presentation, which I, I, I hope to give a real-world example, which is entertaining. Uh, I, uh, it entertains me anyway. Um, and the other thing is an infringer will likely know this process much better than you if somebody's stolen your idea. Um, the infringer will, will use superior knowledge against you right at the outset if it can. So, so let me uh, try to use technology here and share my screen. How interesting. When, when you have free Skype, it, it likes to give you uh, an ad every time you try to share your screen. Yeah. I guess that's the free enterprise system. I like your dog. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. This is actually a slide presentation uh, I gave a few months ago for the UIA at a, at a trade fair. And uh, it went into all different things. It went into patents, trademarks, and copyrights. So I'm going to stop at, at the end of the patent section, but obviously I can address questions on trademarks and copyrights down the road uh, if there are any. So the anatomy of a patent case starts with – actually, first I want to get into the anatomy, the, the anatomy of a patent. Uh, and I, I hope this isn't too rudimentary for, for the group, but uh, it's just a baseline before we start talking about lawsuits. This happens to be a patent that we litigated several years back, and this is why I think this is a, a very entertaining thing to talk about. <laughs> the, just the title of the patent gives it all away. Device for receiving saliva expectorated by a tobacco chewer. So it's, uh, it's great cocktail party fodder. Um, this is a guy uh, named Brian Goodell, who with his co-inventor, Anthony Bautista, invented basically just a lid to go on top of an empty cola or beer can. And, uh, you know, these guys are out in the boonies in, in Southern California, and they drive their pickup trucks all around. And they, um, uh, they, they, they saw a problem and they solved it, and this is the outcome of that. So you see the cover page of the patent, it's got the usual things, the filing date, the issue date, the title, uh, the prior art that was searched by the patent office probably things that most of you have seen before. Here are some patent drawings which give an illustration of what the invention is all about. The patent document itself has several parts to it, and I'm really just working up to the most important part. So the background of the invention is really just an introductory part of a patent. And then the, uh, 
most of the content of a patent happens in what we call the detailed description or the best mode section. And this is where you go into as, as much detail as you possibly can stomach to describe exactly what you invented in its embodiment and in all of the, the variations you can imagine. Now here's the most important part of a, a patent because this is really the, the legal part in terms of what you can do with it. This is the claims of a patent and uh, I can use the mouse as a pointer here. You notice that these are numbered paragraphs with subparagraphs. In this case, there's, uh, there are really two subparts uh, of this particular claim, a beverage container and a device, and then the, you see the words there. What happens in an infringement case is you have to decide, or a jury at the end of the day, will have to decide if a product is practicing all of the elements or limitations of a patent claim. So the way I always explain it is you have to treat the patent claim and every word within it as sort of a checklist. And there's only infringement of a patent if the alleged infringer in their device or in their technology is practicing every single element of a patent claim. So the this is, this is often news to inventors who are new to, to the process um, because there's often a, a perception that if someone has taken the ba basic idea of a patent, then they're an infringer, but that's really not the case. It's a much more rigorous process for deciding if somebody's an infringer. You have to tr treat the patent claim like a checklist and every single word that is in the patent claim has to map onto some aspect of an infringing device. So the patent claim itself, uh, is, it's like a deed to real property. So you, you guys might be familiar with um, how uh, real property is sold and um, there's a, a county recorder of deeds who will have a, a so-called legal description of the land and what you're actually purchasing is the right to quiet enjoyment of, of the land within those boundaries and it's very much the same uh, with patent rights, although it's an intangible right. So with a house and with a property, you can, the legal description will let you uh, figure out where exactly you can put your fence so as to exclude people. And the patent document has something very similar, which is the claims, which is more of, more of like a thought fence or an intellectual fence around which you can, you can um, keep people out. So a court case is like calling the police. It's like saying somebody's a trespasser on your property line, they've crossed over into your property, and you're calling the police to have them dragged away. And of course, in the case of a patent, 98% um, of the time, what the plaintiff is really going after is not so much exclusion and, and blocking people away, like injunctions. 98% uh, of the time, in my experience, the, the patent owner is simply trying to get compensated, so uh, a royalty. So there's something else, I don't know how much we'll get into this, but there's something called the doctrine of equivalence, which for present purposes, we can just think of it as a second bite of the apple for the patentee. If for any reason, the uh, accused infringer perhaps doesn't practice one of the claim elements, but it's so close, it's almost there, there's this legal doctrine um, that lets you say, well, it's so close, there should still be liability for infringement. So in this particular case, with this particular patent, we found an infringer, or my client found an infringer, and, and came to me. And, and uh, we started the process by, actually this is not the start of the process, the start of the process is one slide down. We tried to negotiate with the infringer, and we did this, there are many ways to go about this, and I'll go into some of the variations, but we actually surfaced, we wrote a letter, we tried to be friendly about it. Uh, we explained the infringement. Uh, this is the first page of the notice of infringement. But the negotiations failed. So chronologically, what happened after that was we had to commence a lawsuit. So this is the, the lawsuit that we filed. It's a case called Dip Tops versus Novelty. A complaint is just a piece of paper which has some you know, formulaic parts to it and then you file the piece of paper in court and pay, I think, a $450 filing fee. So that's what starts a lawsuit. 
within the this particular complaint we went into great detail to explain the infringement so let me tell you this case proceeded in a very uh, odd fashion and it ended very quickly but I'll use this slide as a launching pad for explaining very briefly what happens after the complaint so after the complaint is filed uh, there's uh, the pleadings proceed with the infringer filing what's called an answer which is again just another piece of paper and then eventually the court will issue a schedule for the case hopefully if you're lucky leading up to a, a set trial date although sometimes they don't set a trial date right away and so what happens after the pleadings are closed is a process called discovery this is really the most expensive phase of a patent case and in discovery you it's just like what it sounds like you, you try to get the facts so in the case of an infringement let's say it's a computer uh, controlled invention in the case of a computer controlled invention um, a patentee will want to get the source code and the software from the alleged infringer likewise a uh, an alleged infringer will want to get sort of the record of licensing that the patentee has done in the past because that's relevant later on to damages so there are phases of this, fact discovery and expert discovery, documents are exchanged, witnesses are deposed. Of course, a deposition is just um, it's an informal process of taking testimony that happens in a conference room, not in the courthouse, but it still has all the dignity of testimony under oath. Um, so that has to be taken very serious, seriously. And then the slide in front of you is something that we did right away in this particular case. We did it, uh, I think, just days after we filed the complaint. That almost never happens. Um, this is a dispositive motion, first page of a dispositive motion, where we were trying to say our case is so clear that we don't even need to have that whole expensive discovery process. We can just get an early resolution even before we give the case to the jury. So what we were attempting here was to get a declaration of infringement and then uh, the rest of the case would solely be about the damages question. Uh, now, in the ordinary course, dispositive motions are filed after all the discovery has taken place, so after the really expensive part of the, the lawsuit. Um, oftentimes, in conjunction with this, you guys have probably heard about Markman hearings. These are um, a, sort of a mini trial, which can really happen at any phase of, of a patent lawsuit, but often happens after discovery and before dispositive motions. That's where if there are disputes over the meaning of a claim term, a court is given the chance to resolve those disputes. So after the dispositive motion phase, there are other pretrial things that have to happen, like creation of jury instructions. Then there's the trial, which ought to be the main event, of course, and then even if a patentee has won a trial, so you've got a judgment of infringement and a verdict uh, of damages, uh, that's still not the end of the story. We're still at the trial court level. So this, this is true. Whoever loses the trial, whether it's the patentee or the alleged infringer, is now allowed to ask the court to, to sort of throw out the judgment. Those are post-trial motions. And then, uh, as you might imagine, even after that, even when the judgment is final at the district court level, and all the post-trial motions have run their course, then there's a chance to take an appeal. So here I'm just showing a, a, a screen where we were, in our motion for summary judgment, we we're trying to demonstrate how clear the infringement was. This uh, green cap on top of the, the Pepsi can was the alleged infringing device. And what, what you see is we're trying to map the words of the patent claim onto the specific parts of the accused device. That's exactly how you prove infringement. Hey, Robert. So, Hello? yes, I, I heard my name. Uh, yeah, this is Roger Jackson. Um, <clears throat> I'm the local patent attorney here. Did, did you guys happen to do a, a claims comparison chart or opinion on infringement first? You know, I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble hearing. Can someone close to the mic repeat the question? Yeah, Roger, I think that one. You're going to have to come up here and oh, yeah. tell them. Go the microphone <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. the furthest from the mic. Um, did you guys happen to do a claims comparison chart or a, an infringement opinion prior to filing the complaint? Uh, in this particular case, we we didn't have a chart of this level of detail before we filed the lawsuit. I think, but we had it within days of filing the lawsuit. 
Um, our usual practice, uh, almost 100% of the time, is to do something exactly what you said. And, and uh, I think it's the ethical and responsible thing to do. Um, before you file a lawsuit, you uh, basically create a memo to file, which is a resource that you can go back to again and again throughout the life of the case, which is uh, you, you actually construe the claims according to all the legal standards, and then you apply the claims perhaps with a chart like what you see on the screen. Uh, so that was a very good question. Uh, it's something that we do almost every time before we file a lawsuit. Um, in this particular case, uh, I think we knew we were going to do it anyway right after the complaint was filed, which we did within days. And this is this is part of the out output here. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, just yes. continue on how did your uh, motion for summary judgment come out? Well, we settled actually. So uh, I was I was part of me, of course, was hoping that we wouldn't settle so that we could get um, this sort of uh, remarkable early summary judgment for the patentee. Uh, but the case did settle, and of course, that's the client's decision to you know to come to a negotiated resolution. So finally, after this, really a, a microscopic ordeal in in the uh, big scheme of things, um, the uh, the case ended. Now, I'll put myself on the screen. I think it's kind of funny. Uh, I, have to, I have to click stop sharing in order to share my own, my own image. Um, so while all this is going on in the ordinary course of a normal patent infringement lawsuit, an alleged infringer has many tools, many weapons in its arsenal to throw against you, the inventor. So, one of the tools, uh, or one of the tools in the arsenal, is to use patent office proceedings to force the patent office to take a second bite, a second crack at your patent. Um, the various flavors of this is almost an alphabet soup, but uh, ex parte reexamination, inter partes review covered business method patent review, post-grant review. Uh, while in, in, in a typical case, I'm actually dealing with this right now, I have an opponent who told me just today that we just filed a complaint and what they're going to do is they're going to seek inter partes review in the patent trademark office and so they want to find out if I consent to a stay of the litigation while they try to work out the validity issues in the patent and trademark office. Uh, my, you know, instinctively, my gut reaction is absolutely not, <laughs> but uh, we'll see how that plays out. So, there are many, many ways that a defendant, uh, an alleged infringer, can delay a case, make a case more expensive for the patentee, and and those are some of them. So, here's what's happening in the world today: uh, when inventors or patentees file lawsuits. If things don't go well, and they often don't because patentees only win on the merits about 30% of all patent infringement lawsuits, and that 70% that just statistically on the merits the, the patentee is going to lose in court, um, it's almost uh, uh, inevitable that the alleged infringer who's won the patent infringement lawsuit going to take an aggressive action against the patentee who lost, and it's unfortunate, but um, it's, it's very commonplace these days for winning infringers or alleged infringers, when they win, to, to seek attorney's fees from the side who lost. So that's just the reality of the day. So um, combined, combined with that, I'm not, not giving you good news when I tell you this, but combined with that, there's some recent court decisions that say if during the course of the litigation you've offered a settlement, you've offered a license to the other side, and the license price that you're offering is below the cost of litigation, then that can be used as an indicator of your bad faith, which is astonishing. It's, it, the world is upside down in some ways because it used to be the case that if you offered a settlement of a lawsuit that was below the cost of litigation, not only was that the rational business thing to do, uh, but it also was a, a check mark in your favor, showing your good faith because you're you're not trying to hold up the uh, the other side for anything more than is appropriate. 
the reality of the world is that there's optimistic conduct on both sides that happens. Probably not as much as, as you read about in the newspapers and the blogs, but opportunistic conduct in the sense that patent cases are expensive. We, as the inventor community, have known for years and decades, really perhaps even into the 19th century, that alleged infringers will use the costs and burdens of litigation to try to grind the inventors and dissuade them from, from pursuing their rights. Um, what you see lately is a growing awareness that a small set of folks on the team side who are uh, using what, what I call opportunist conduct and trying to blackmail settlements. But uh, it's you know, very newsworthy. It's gotten a lot of attention lately, but I think it's very uncommon. So now let me turn to the, the nub of the talk here. What, what can you do? You're an inventor, you own your patent, you've discovered infringement, and, and what are you gonna do about it? Well, it's a hard road, Ed, and uh, you have to be ready for that. So you can, you can go all on your own and try to get compensated for the infringement. That's what we call being pro se. Uh, you can retain a fee-based attorney help you try to, to for your rights. You can look for a contingency fee attorney to help you fight for your rights. Or you can go and um, gauge the, the sort of a, what I call a licensing services company, but what uh, in the present day can be called uh, NPEs for non-practicing it, PAE for search and entity. This is, this is another alphabet soup. Uh, and then, of course, what I call the infringer lobby has come up with the most powerful version of the patent role. Um, I think that's uh, an epithet, which really has no place in public discourse, but we see that all the time. So let's just call these licensing services companies. And there's not one size fits all in that area either. There are some folks there who help inventors only if the inventor sells the patent rights, actually an outright assignment of the patent. Uh, then there are other companies that will allow the inventor to keep ownership of the patent, but will take um, an exclusive license uh, to the patent, which, which would itself give the licensing company standing to bring the lawsuit. And so in return for this, of course, the licensing company would uh, really um, assume all the risks of litigation, risks of losing. Uh, and uh, the financial risks as well. So a variety of terms are possible, and I've seen I've seen the gamut when um, when I've represented those types of entities. So I've represented individual inventors who sue in their own name. I've also represented the licensing services companies. So uh, sometimes um, sometimes there's an upfront fee, a, a purchase price paid to the inventor for the rights. Other times it's all back end. So the inventor doesn't receive anything right away, but simply participates in any recoveries that the licensing company will, will receive. Now, the licensing company really, uh, in a perfect world, doesn't want litigation, doesn't seek out litigation. Even when they initiate litigation sort of out of the blue, it's not because their business is to sue people. Their business is, of course, to try to make money and uh, earn royalties for the patent. So, Aside from the entity that might be the patentee, that might be seeking the licensing, uh, seeking the royalties, the question arises, do you, do you write or do you sue first? And that's always a very nuanced question that, that has to be addressed. And there's no one right answer or wrong answer. It depends very much on the situation. It depends on uh, the gumption of the patent owner as well as the, the you know, sort of perceived uh, Aggression of the investor, uh, and um, as well as the value of the claim. So, if you, for example, if you get a letter saying you're infringing my patent, please talk to me about licensing discussions. Uh, you just expose yourself to being sued. It's it's a reality of the day that you, you write the nicest letter to the meanest infringer, but if the letter says you are in any way, fashion, or form you are infringing my patent rights and here's a copy of the patent, they have the authority to go into court and actually sue you. So you can start to see the, the potential value of having an intermediary sort of be there to be the one who's sued. Um, and as I said, much depends on what the future damages could be.
fee. So whether you're talking about contingency fee attorneys or services companies, they're, before they deal with you, before they're willing to pay you for your rights, they're going to want to know the magnitude of the infringement. What is the market like? What, what are the economic models that can be built to prove damages? So uh, just as a rule of thumb, if it's a low value infringement claim, you don't think the other side will be motivated to sue you when you're just trying to resolve a dispute. Uh, you probably are okay writing a letter notifying them of infringement. If it's a high value infringement claim against like a very aggressive litigation defendant, then maybe you want to serve us first by filing a lawsuit. So uh, just to conclude, and, and then I'll take some questions, you know, it's a long road to success as an inventor seeking justice. It really is. So stay motivated get educated, and keep inventing. I did. Okay. Uh, Robert, <clears throat> any, uh, somebody have questions here? Um, there was mention about the small claims court. Oh, yes. Robert, small claims court. Tell us yeah, about it. Oh, wow. That, uh, that's one of my, my pet issues. Yes, we need one. <laughs> yes, well, you know, it occurred to me that we need one, just looking at the statistics, there's a group out there called the American Intellectual Property Law Association, uh, and what AIPLA does is they put out statistics every year, results of their, or every two years, the result of their member survey. Uh, one of the pieces of data that they collect is that for a patent infringement lawsuit where less than $1 million is at stake, so the claim for damages is going to be a million dollars or less. The median, half of, that means half or above this point, half or below this point, the median cost of litigation for a side is $600,000. Uh, it's just astonishing. And then if you get to the uh, 75th percentile cost of litigation, it's actually more than the claim for it. That's for one side of the lawsuit. So, this really got me to, to uh, sharpen my pencil and do some research, and I found out that there was an idea being thrown, being tossed around in the late 90s, early 1990s for a patent small claims court, and uh, the idea just dropped. It just went away, uh, and I I took it up again. I, I searched the history of it, and then I had, I wrote an article that got published in a law review that advocated for uh, a small claims proceeding. And that would be something that benefits both the defendants and the patent owners, because what the defendant community ought to recognize is that um, if we reduce the transaction costs of these disputes, if we, reduce, if we reduce sharply the cost of litigation, then this rare situation of patentee who's using his patent for holdup purposes of blackmail won't ever go away, but that situation will be sharply reduced. Um, the value of any negotiated resolution will be much closer to the actual, you know, true or, or value of the claim. So, um, currently, there's, um, well, the, the, I'm, a, I'm a part of the Inventors Association, and right now we're we're trying to have a, a voice in the current debates that are going on in Washington about whether there's legislation to deal with the so-called patent control problem. And one of the things we're trying to do, and I'm not, I'm not sure if we're succeeding or not, but in fact, we're probably not, but we're trying to put the um, small claims court issue on the table for sort of patent reform legislation. Um, it's something actually that the patent is, is in favor of, but as various organizations. What, what is the resistance? Where is that coming from, Robert? Uh, it's coming from incumbent industry, just like any resistance to any any change that might help the patentee. Uh, so, and, and frankly, from folks who don't think the problem through that deeply, I think that uh, the gut reaction to such a proposal by common industries is that it's going to open the floodgates. It's going to make it easier for patentees to file lawsuits. That, that's all I can think of. I haven't really seen any articulated uh, sort of sensical opposition to the idea. I, I think it's just um, a gut feeling that would open the floodgates to more litigation. Well, if, you know, I look at that and say, well, why should I even bother with patenting if 
you know, I, I'd be better off just going to market with an armed product. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, when you're looking at six hundred thousand dollars for litigation, if somebody infringes, where do you go with that? I mean, I I had a client that three years from the time the pa their patent expired, their um, distributor who was actually a retailer distributor was had the product all over the country actually infringed on their product because they knew they couldn't afford the litigation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the way I presented it in my article in 2009 was that the patent system has failed. It has. A significant number of inventors, folks whose, whose property is being stolen. That's right. Now, there is a counterpoint. There's a balancing. You know, you're, you're not completely without options in this world because... Um, as much as I'm reluctant to say it out loud it, when I'm actually negotiating a settlement with my counterpart on the other side of the case, uh, the infringer is also going to be looking at potential of all these costs of litigation. And so you've got to be acting in good faith. You have to believe you have a true blue infringement claim and a valid patent. But I personally don't think there's anything wrong with reminding the, your negotiating counterpart that, you know, why don't we just resolve this thing now? Because it's going to cost you more to find out that, that you're right uh, than it would to resolve the case right now. Um, I'm I regret that that's a tool in my box for negotiating resolutions, but but the reality is that it, it does counterbalance some of the problems that we see with the patentee. Robert, how about um, an alternative dispute resolution? Yeah, that, that's actually been raised by the infringement community as a reason to oppose a small claims court process. Uh, but, you know, the problem with, it's called ADR, another, I don't know what it is about bit soup in business, but alternative dispute resolution, it could take either two forms. One is mediation, which is non-binding, and the other is arbitration, which is binding. Um, and arbitration is like a miniature court case where you're contractually agreeing that whatever this arbitrator or group of arbitrators decides, you're going to live with it. Um, the problem with ADR is it has to be voluntary. You have to actually have a, two sides to a dispute who want to do that, and it's not compulsive. Uh, compulsive in this context is a good thing. If you can compel somebody to come into a small claims proceeding, then you guarantee that uh, you know, you're, you're going to get to an outcome. But you can't force somebody into alternative just resolution processes. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, hi, Robert. Uh, my name's Christian. I, I have a couple questions. It may not be exactly on topic. Is that OK? Uh, please. Sure. Okay. Um, so first time meeting here for the uh, RMIA. For myself and I have a couple of ideas I think the one that I want to pursue I think the one that has the most um, I guess that has the strongest legs to it utilizes some existing uh, utilizes an existing product in a completely different way that's intended uh, all the technology involved in that product fully patented all kinds of stuff but what I've used it or what I've discovered is it, it, it works great for something completely unintended by the manufacturer and those that own the patent. So what advice would you give to someone like me who has an idea that's somebody else's but is used for something totally different? Well, all right, what's your intention? Uh, do you want to go into business? Do you want to form uh, a company or a product line around the idea? I think, yeah, I think initially uh, that would probably be the way to go. And then uh, I think if I can show growth within a, a two or three year period, then I'd love to sell the business. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting you said that because one of the good reasons to go try to patent is if you want to develop your intangible assets, put them into a company and uh, show, you know, demonstrate a record of success with the company or image success and then sell the company. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you have an idea of becoming that kind of a start where you, in relatively short time, you want to sell the company, it's a good idea to get patents. Um, because uh, purchasers of a company are going to want to see that you have the sophistication to have done that. They're also going to want to know that you um, have something that's protectable. Sure. Uh, and uh, sort of a very related point is that to get financing for the company, oftentimes, you know, bank financing or venture financing, 
uh, you get loans by securing those loans with your IP. Uh -huh. So I'll start by telling you, you're, you're thinking in the right direction. The, uh, the patentability question you raised is uh, a, good, a good question. The, um, it's one of the few questions that's answered 100% with 100% certainty by the statute itself. And the Patent Act says that can get a patent on a new previously unknown use of a known object or item. So you, you can use something that already existed, but if you, can, if you use it in a completely different way that nobody's done before, it's a non-obvious application of, of prior uses, then you can get a patent. Hmm. Of course, uh, you know, your patent attorney is going to uh, uh, be responsible for deciding whether to do a prior art or the art search. So, you know, oftentimes it turns out someone's thought of ideas before like this, but when if the search comes up that you're the first one to think of it, then the road should be clear for you to apply that and hopefully get it. Okay, okay, that helps. Right, any other questions? Um, <clears throat> you said 98% uh, of the time you're pursuing damages. Um, does that mean that the, ob the, um, the concept of an injunction is not a, a prospect currently? Have you been watching uh, Apple versus Samsung in the news? No. Uh, that's that's a very interesting thing. So uh, Apple v. Samsung, Apple has a, a patent or a set of patents covering its uh, you know, aspects of its iPhone. They tried to get an injunction against Samsung, and they couldn't, uh, even though there was infringement after trial. They couldn't get a permanent injunction. And the reason was they couldn't show that the, the basis for customer demand for the product was the patent feature. So uh, it's very rare for a grant a, an injunction uh, at the beginning of the case and also still very rare for a grant at the end of the case. That all changed. It used to be that it was rare to get a preliminary injunction, but it was uh, it almost came with the territory to get an injunction after you win at trial. But now, uh, there or recently, I think it was 2007, there was a Supreme Court case called eBay v. Merck Exchange, where um, the Supreme Court said that we should no longer presume that a patentee is entitled to injunction even after it's proved infringement and has a verdict and a judgment of infringement. So that, that really weakened patent rights back in 2007. A lot of folks, myself included, are, are philosophically opposed to the outcome in that case, because if a patent is a property right, what ought to come with the territory is the right to exclude. So uh, it got harder to get a permanent injunction, and it's always been hard to get a preliminary injunction. Hmm. Um, the uh, case that you described um, didn't sound like it covered a, a, a design patent. How, how is a design patent different than uh, what you described? In, in, you know, in a lot of ways, it's identical. You analyze the issues. Uh, but in a lot of ways, it's very, very different. So, uh, for the benefit of everybody, there's there are two flavors, two kinds of patents. One is a utility patent, which you saw in my in my slide images with the uh, with the dip top. Uh, the utility patent covers new, useful, non-obvious machine method of, of, of article of commerce, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A design patent is uh, just it doesn't cover the things that you know written patent claim. Instead, it covers the ornamental aspects of a design as depicted in the drawings. So, in the Apple versus Samsung case, one of the uh, patents happened to be a design patent, and uh, Apple, I think, got subject to a lot of ridicule in the blogosphere because the design patent essentially covered the rounding off of the corners of an otherwise rectangular mobile phone. So I suppose that was the ornamental aspect of the design. Um, a lot of the uh, error analysis happens just the same way as in the utility patent. So you, you have issues of anticipation, you have issues of obviousness, a patent he has to overcome to win a trial, and then you can get an injunction still, but be under the standards articulated in, in the eBay case, so it's still gonna be tough, even if you win a design patent case. Um, I happen to be, in one of my, I will confess to the, to the group of uh, I actually defend against patent infringement charges sometimes. Don't tell anybody, but I wear the black too. Uh, but um, one of the cases that I'm defending against
against is a design patent case, and we uh, we found some prior art that just we thought was just knockout prior art. So we did something that I've only done once in my career so far, which is we filed a request for ex parte reexamination, and, and so right now the patent office has that under objection. What if the infringer uh, resides in China? <coughs> uh, yeah, um, two things. <coughs> You've got to factor that in before you even start the process. If the infringer is in China, if it's a case worth pursuing financially, one way to pursue it is to take it to the International Trade Commission. Uh, but there are a lot of hurdles. So the ITC is not is not actually a court. It's actually a branch of the Commerce Department. And what they do is, uh, if you win your case in front of the ITC, it's part of the executive branch of government, they will shut the board of infringing products, so they block imports of the infringing product. But to even get there, you have to show that there exists a so-called domestic industry in the patented good. And, and so if you as an inventor uh, just have you know, a patent you're not using, you might have a very, very difficult ITC in, in the relief. You could simultaneously or alternatively go into a federal court which is a real court, um, but uh, if you, even if you win the case, you might have trouble enforcing it or something like that, uh, particularly for money damages. And in our experience, we, we sometimes still find it useful to go to if the, if the infringer is uh, an offshore knockoff company because you know it's happened before, some visitors don't show up, and then you know you get a default judgment, and then you can wreak havoc with their business. Even though they, are trying to duck uh, the United States justice system. Another question? Yeah. Uh, for my idea, I happened onto a company out of Ontario. I, I'm going to need help with the audio. Okay. <laughs> I'm you sorry. Move up, <laughs> move up so that you can hear. Um, with my idea, I happened onto a company out of Ontario, Canada that has a similar concept, but the design is, uh, it's, it's made out of metal. My, uh, my idea, I want to make out of plastic, and I have a little bit different uh, design uh, idea. So uh, do I have to be concerned about it coming out of Ontario, Canada? Do you have to do research on an international patent that they have, or? Well, so it sounds like you've got some sort of useful idea that, you, that you're thinking of yes. obtaining a patent on? Yes. Okay, so you, you said design, which could sometimes mean the ornamental side of things rather than the utility side. It, it's more um, personal care type of thing for women. Y sure. So activities that happen in Canada will count as prior art. The short answer to your question. So uh, if something is happening in Canada and it's close or it's, um, you know, the closest prior, the closest activities, the closest state of the art to what you're thinking of, you would certainly want to consider that, you know, in your cost benefit of going forward with the patent application. And then if you file a patent application to get the best, strongest patent, you would, of course, want to disclose that to the patent office so they can factor that into their analysis. So there is a con there could be a conflict between someone applying for a U.S. patent versus the, you know someone with an international or well for something to uh, undermine your chances of getting a patent it can be something from the U.S. or it can be something from overseas uh, so that that always has to be factored in. Prior, prior art can be anything that's out there, anything. Yes. You know, it doesn't have to be the United States, any country. Yeah, there used to be, used to be some loopholes in the law. Let's say there was a trade show in Germany, but not for reasons that nobody could figure out. Trade shows in Germany were not considered you know, places where prior art could arise. I think, I think those loopholes have been. I don't care if there's new software available. <laughs> Is that a mic? That's yours. Just quit it. <laughs>
Hey, get out of there. Okay. These little pop-up screens, they annoy you. Okay. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes, I do. Okay, Alex has a question. Where's that sure. Alex? Here's Alex. If uh, there is a product on the market uh, also produced in different country and it's been there a while and they don't have a patent for that and we're producing similar kind of product, uh, can they uh, uh, start any kind of both, uh, case about that? Uh, of course it depends. It's, I'm, I'm sorry, the lawyer. Um, probably not. I mean, if they don't have a patent portfolio or patent covering what they're, what they're producing, then they couldn't come after you. That would require uh, a clearance search, a product clearance search, to really be sure whether they have a patent or not. But one thing to keep in mind, something may seem like it's in the public domain because you can't locate anyone who has a patent claim on it, uh, but if it's, a, if, it, if it's a shape of a product or a configuration of a product which seems to have its own distinctiveness that you associate in your mind with the other company, it could have a kind of trademark protection even though it's not patenting. So just imagine like the Coca-Cola bottle, uh, you know, I'm sure there's no patent covering the Coca-Cola bottle, but the Coca-Cola bottle shape is so specific to Coca-Cola it's considered to have trade dress protection that belongs to Coca-Cola, so you wouldn't be able to use that exact shape. But that's for reasons wholly apart from the patent system. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. The general rule, I think your instinct is right. The general rule is if, if a, there's something out there which doesn't have a patent protecting it, it's a public domain. You make uh, a competing product and you would try to do it better, cheaper, faster, you know. Questions? Are you okay with another question here, Robert? Uh, I'm, I'm at your disposal. Okay. Until the dog starts barking. <laughs> okay. So I have um, a, a line of tools, and I have a guy in China that pretty much copies everything we come out with. Um, and it doesn't sound like it's worth pursuing from a financial basis on existing products, but. Um, what would you set as a strategy for new products coming out mm. to try to dissuade this individual from just copying it as fast as he can get a sample of it? And you, you have patents covering the uh, items? I have uh, items that he's copied that are patented, yes. Okay. Uh, I think probably the best strategy, if you can't, if you can't do anything over there to stop him. If, you, if you're not able to go into the International Trade Commission to get an exclusion order, the, the next best thing is to go to the rules that you sell through and make them aware of the patent. Make them aware that you, you would want to do this most likely with the, the patent attorney. Make sure you don't have a misstep. Uh, I'll explain one particular step as possible. But you would go to their retailers and you would explain to them that We've discovered this product, it's infringing. We ask, please cease getting your supply from them and get them from us instead. Um, the misstep that's possible is uh, if you haven't done your homework, uh, if the patent is really not infringed, the patent is just clearly invalid and, and you might even know the facts, the end goes invalidity, um, someone can come after you for what's called bad faith patent assertions. And so there are various uh, state law tort claims to be made against the patent owner, despite the First Amendment. Uh, don't get me started on that. But um, it is possible for an alleged infringer to sue a patentee who has uh, simply told a third party that they believe that the patent is infringed. Okay. What What about forthcoming products? I mean, can you can you design a strategy for? preventing an individual from copying your stuff? I, uh, I guess the short answer would be no. You can't, you can't prevent them from doing the copying. Um, I think you just have to wait for the, for the knock-up to come and then, and then take action based on the situation. 
Now, do you do you know the uh, personalities involved? Do I know the personalities? Um, well, in, the, in the sense that do you know the uh, the factory who's doing it, do you have a sense of the the the, the family connections of the person who who's the leader of the factory or anything like that? I know who it is. Yeah, yeah. You could you, know, you could send a letter across the across the ocean and uh, make them aware of your patent rights. Aside from that, if, if they're really copying, you know, you just have to wait until those copies come on shore and, and react. I guess what my question was getting towards was, um, I mean, it's expensive to file patents everywhere. Um, what is it? A, a plausible option to file patents in China? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, now you have to comply with all their uh, being on time to the patent office and, and being valid over prior. But China, uh, oddly, last 10 years, they have some of the most patentee friendly rules and processes anywhere in the world. I have one client where uh, I helped them file the U.S. patents. They're still in the process in the Patent and Trademark Office two years later. But he filed the same application in China, and he got it, uh, an issued patent in China six months ago. And what they do, they might have been, they might have, this is good news, actually. They might be going a little, little too far in the direction of protecting intellectual property, some people think. But if you have an issued patent in China, which, like I said, in my experience, you might be able to get within six months, then uh, the way they enforce patents, they actually send the uh, state police, the, the jackbooted thugs, if you will, into the infringer's factory and shut down the production. So I, I, I'm, I'm glad you clarified, because I thought you were just talking about having a U.S. patent. But if you have a Chinese patent, that could be very powerful for it. Okay, can how the, can the thugs the take guns with them? Yeah, they do take guns with them. Oh, good. <laughs> it's, it's really astonishing. What, uh, how would you compare, Robert, the, the, I know you can't get specifics, but compared to the cost of a U.S. patent, the uh, cost of, of getting a Chinese patent? Uh, uh, one fourth to one half. A lot less expensive. Okay. So it's Good. less expensive to file patents there? Yes, and the litigation is much less expensive. Viola. And do you, um, do you, uh, do litigation against infringements in China, or do you know of someone that does that? I, I have a role of it. Uh, I mean, I, I haven't I haven't been involved in those cases myself, but I I have you know a network of folks that I would to or refer people to. Okay, good. Okay. Yes. Uh, what about personal liability? Do you have to make sure that you have a uh, corporation status to protect you from uh, them, at, 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 you know, trying to take away your personal assets. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it, that's a, an excellent question. We generally advise our in, inventor clients not to sue in their own name. We actually advise them to form an LLC uh, and transfer the patent right into the LLC. Uh, you can be a it, a 100% owner of the LLC in total control of it, but is, as the name suggests, a limited liability company. Uh, they're authorized under state law. For tax purposes, it's treated like a partnership. So for tax purposes, it's just you. It's not You're not getting any benefit on the tax side. Uh, but what it does is it, it does um, restrict the liability to the assets of the LLC in case there's uh, you know any downside in a certain so that, that's an excellent idea. You you really want to pay attention to the corporate information and make sure you're doing it right, maybe with a straight up business attorney, because the uh, the risk is that all that effort to create the, the limited liability shell could fail five years from now if somebody in hindsight decides that you didn't capitalize it correctly or you didn't you didn't have your annual meeting or you know you didn't comply with corporate formalities or if they say you commingled the funds. This is called uh, piercing corporate veil. So you want to uh, order bears to minimize the, the danger that somebody wants the corporate veil to try to get to your personal benefits. 
All right. Thank you very, very much, Robert. Um, lots of very valuable information. Um, we have your contact information on our website, um, and everyone has it. Um, and I, I really